I now declare the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened into open session, that all council members are present. Our first item on the preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting from the executive session. We have personnel appointments, board of adjustments. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Riccadelli and myself have uh, not had an opportunity to discuss this position and request that it be tabled to the uh, January 23rd meeting. I will second that motion to table. All right. All in favor to table, please raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes. The next item is Planning and Zoning Commission Interim Member. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and I have discussed this item and has dis have decided to bring forward the name of Bill Lyle. Okay. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second to appoint Bill Lyle to the Planning and Zoning Commission interim member. All in favor? Motion passes, eight to zero. Thank you. Item two, discussion and direction of, uh, regarding the project list for DART funding allocation. Mayor and Council, as you're aware, uh, DART is returning funds to cities, uh, member cities, on the basis of sales tax for the city of Plano and in other cases for other cities, both sales tax and population-based funds through the uh, Regional Transportation um, Commission. So in looking at um, the interlocal agreement that DART has proposed for the city, they have some uh, constraints on what they would like the funds to be used for. Um, in taking those, um, in taking that guidance, we have actually worked with staff to develop a list, and Mr. Carr is um, the tip of the spear for us uh, in discussing those projects with DART, and we wanted to bring those forward to you tonight to get um, some general direction from y'all so that we could uh, bring that project list back simultaneously with that interlocal agreement and get those uh, passed at the same time from the City Council. So with that, I'll kick it over to Mr. Carr. Thank you for that introduction, Mr. Israelson. Mayor, Council, I'm Jack Carr, Deputy City Manager over the Development Services team. And again, we're talking about uh, the DART funding allocation that Mr. Israelson just uh, identified. Taking us back just a little bit uh, to talk about uh, where does DART get their funds? Their funds primarily come from the one cent sales tax from each one of the individual cities. COVID had an impact on their revenue and uh, it uh, talked about uh, the uh, reduction of the, um, the number of riders so they didn't have the, the fares. And they also had an increase in expenses associated with uh, the PPE, the, the mask, and uh, everything else that we had to do. They had to do it as well. They also had cleaning supplies. And because of those additional expenses and the loss of revenue, the federal government provided financial assistance. And at the end of that program, they looked at uh, what they had as far as finances, and they realized they had unspent sales tax and they determined that was a significant amount and determined that uh, that would be distributed back to the cities, as Mr. Israelson has already talked about. So they have uh, interlocal agreement. It's fairly restrictive as described, and uh, it gives the parameters of what to do. This meeting tonight, what we're talking about is the actual list of what we're going to propose to ask for. So the, the amount of the, uh, the sales tax that was unspent that's coming back to Plano is 28 million. Um, transportation projects, um, are, it's, it's bound by the, the transportation code. The Texas Transportation Code uh, is the mechanism that they use to collect the tax, and it's the same mechanism that they have to use to spend the money. So we're bound by the same parameters that they're bound by through uh, the Texas uh, Transportation Code. So the um, projects must meet those ILA parameters. And uh, what we're going to do is submit projects to DART and let them determine the eligibility. So they're very um, specific about what's eligible and what's not. We're going to um, probably test the edges on that and, and see if we can get uh, a lot of these that look like they're uh, right on the edge and we'll, we'll get those uh, uh, evaluated and determine that eligibility. So with each one of those projects that we're talking about, the reimbursement at the end of that has to be requested 
before April 30th, 2026. Sounds like a long time from now, but there's so many different uh, uh, steps in the process that it's going to be um, may be difficult to, to, to meet that with some of our projects if we have easements to acquire and um, you know there's different parameters that working with CIP you've seen some projects that take a long time. Um, there's other dates in, in that uh, we have to complete all of the, the project submittals, the request for the projects a year from now. So it'd be uh, January 31st to 24. Uh, we have to award the projects in February of the following year, so February 28th to 25. We have to have substantial completion for the projects in January of uh, the following year, 26, and then request those funds, as I've just stated, by uh, uh, April 30th of 26. So all of that is going to be rolled into an ILA that you'll see at a later meeting. Uh, we're not talking about uh, that right now tonight, except the list of projects that we're uh, going to draft and put into that initial ILA. Now, the, the project list can change over that next 12 months. Remember, I, I just said that uh, the project list has to be submitted by January 31st of next year. So we've got 12 months to actually massage that list, to add, delete, whatever. But what we want to do is uh, take a look at the, the list of projects and see if we can get um, a concurrence or some direction on that as far as these projects look good, these are the most important projects, and once we get that ILA approved, we'll know that we want to get started quickly on, on the highest priority projects. And let me take a little bit of time and go through this list of projects. Uh, the first one is the Public Works Complex. It's at the intersection of Commerce in uh, Plano Parkway. Uh, that's where the, the Public Works team operates out of. And we are uh, an aging city, and because of that, the Public Works team is a growing entity. They have to have more and more people and equipment to maintain our aging infrastructure. And with that, we have a master plan that is underway right now to evaluate what, we're need, what we need now and what we'll need into the future. And we've evaluated to the point that we know that we're going to need some additional land. The land that we're thinking about is the Jack Hatchell Transit Center, located on the south side of 15th, on the east side of Commerce. And we've started some, uh, just preliminary, based on this, this conversation we're having right now, based on that, we've started a conversation with DART to see if we could actually take some or all of it. I don't think we can take all of it because they still have to have a, a presence out there with a, um, uh, at least a bus stop to, to pick up people and, and move people around. So uh, that's the first item that we have on the list. And if I can just keep moving through these, number two is a parking garage in the downtown area. So uh, when I first landed in Plano, the very first conversation I had from the downtown uh, merchants was parking. Parking has always been a big issue. And um, right now we've had uh, conversations about uh, a parking garage. We have an ideal location for it. It's adjacent to the uh, downtown platform. And it'll give us, you know, I'm trying to remember the number. It's 500, 600 uh, parking spaces. This item that we're proposing is uh, to acquire the land. We can move on with uh, the design part of it, the construction part of it, need be, but right now we're talking about just the land purchase for that. Number three is uh, the arterial street maintenance. And we know that uh, DART and everybody else uses the streets, and because of uh, the wear and tear that we have on the streets, we want to make sure that we keep those streets in the best condition possible. And you've seen uh, uh, Mr. Prendergraf, the, um, uh, Dan has provided um, information that shows you the, the wear and tear and the, uh, the maintenance curve. When you slide around that curve too far, you can't bring it back. And when you can't bring it back, that means you have to get your jackhammers out and tear it out completely. And it's disruptive uh, to the motorists. Where they have to actually have detour routes. Um, and it's costly, it's far more costly to, to actually remove and replace than it is to do the street maintenance. And what we're talking about is the, the uh, ultra-thin overlays, the under -sealing, the less uh, intrusive as far as uh, you know, time frame and less intrusive to the traffic, and that kind of uh, maintenance as opposed to total reconstruction. It's beneficial to DART because they don't have their buses going around uh, following those detours for you know, the length of that project that could be, you know, over a year to actually rebuild a street. The next item is an item that uh, Council Member Smith 
provided to us. The idea is for a senior rides program. Looking at what DART already has, they have a DART rides program. It's for 65 and older people and uh, others with uh, disabilities that are registered, qualified disabilities, and it's the DART rides program that, uh, that they have offered to those riders. With that, there's an expense. It's not free, but it, there's an expense associated with that. And I think the, the program that was suggested is, is to subsidize even that, to get that down to a, a even lesser cost, maybe a, 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 free, a free ride. Uh, that will take a lot of work to get through that. It's, it's a small dollar amount. And I want to remind everybody that we have to have the, the program expenses completed by April 30th of 26. So this would be a short-term project, and everything has to be spent out of that by April of 26. So it would be just small dollar amount in a short, short period of time. Next item is the uh, residential street repair. You've seen uh, the Public Works Department have area by area where they go into a, a particular spot and actually go through and look at all the deficiencies, all the defects, and, and fix the streets, fix the sidewalks, and uh, work at it uh, area by area. That is important for them, for DART, because of the, uh, the DART Rides program, the Go Link, and even the pedestrians that are actually walking from those residential areas to get to the, um, the, the transit stop. The number six is actually a more robust part of that. It's the sidewalk program in itself. So we have uh, many locations around Plano where the arterial, we have no sidewalks. You can just drive along and you can see there's just a gap for you know maybe a quarter mile or a mile of just no sidewalks. That could be on an arterial, could be on a collector. There's some residential areas that uh, have no sidewalks as well. So that would be a sidewalk program to, to fill in those gaps repair the uh, deficiencies, the um, ADA ramps may not be in compliance with regulations that would fix those, as well as the trip hazards. And trip hazards are an important subject because we get uh, a bunch of complaints. We do our best to keep up with those, but this would help us do that. Item seven is the traffic signal system. Um, you've heard uh, presentations from uh, Mr. Shusky and talking about the, uh, the work that we're proposing to do uh, it goes up above $20 million worth of work. Uh, this particular element would uh, be the cabinets and the controllers, the fiber optics within the, uh, the system itself, and the video detection. A lot of times when you see a, a traffic signal, it just doesn't seem to be working right. It's because the traffic signal controller doesn't know you're sitting there. The video detector is actually what tells the controller you have traffic sitting there. So that would uh, help out with that. And the last one is a really small project, but it's probably one of the, the projects that fits the bullseye of what uh, uh, DART is looking for. This would be a sidewalk connection between the K Avenue lofts that's under construction at the northwest corner of K and Park. And um, with that uh, added residential area, this would give a sidewalk that actually connects that residential project directly to the platform at uh, the Parker Road station. Right now, you go out there and look, and you can see where the fence is all beat down for, from people crawling over, and you can see the, the paths where people are doing it. You add this, that many more people living there, and it'll be even more important. This is about $350,000, but it's, it's right in their wheelhouse as far as what they're looking for. So at this point, uh, I'm looking for a conversation, direction, and possibly concurrence with what we have with the understanding that this project list can change. Uh, but the, the most important thing for me is that once the ILA is approved, I know what, what projects you guys want to, to start with immediately and move quickly because time is uh, going to start ticking once that ILA gets approved. And Mr. Card, uh, the, the total amount of these eight projects um, is well above the $28 million. If you do the math on it, it's either $50 million, or if you put the parking garage construction in, it's $65 million. So and yes, with that, we'll, we'll spend $28 million. Correct. And, and with that, our, our goal would be to, to move on several of these simultaneously. Oh, correct. Yes. Yeah. And what I've offered is um, categories. When we finally get to uh, requesting the projects, the arterial street maintenance may need to have the name of the arterial, from to the intersections and get a price tag for it. But these are categories of projects just basically for a starting point of this discussion. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Pro Tem. On number three, the arterial street maintenance, would that include Park Boulevard or not? Because <clears throat> that's going to be more of a larger rebuild than just so street maintenance. The arterial street maintenance is the, the, um, the ultra thin overlay, the asphalt overlay that you see. The under ceiling that you really don't know happened, but it's a ceiling from the bottom. Right. And it would be any one of the arterials in a systematic process, prioritize it and work through it. I think the easy answer to your question is yes. Okay, so we would be able to get park done in time? So Park Boulevard is on our list and it's been moved up in our priority list with Mr. I'm looking up at Dan real quick. Um, Mr. Prendergast, and so, so that is on our list within the next. And, and the, the, the question is the reconstruction as right. opposed to the overlay. And Mr. Israelson is just exactly right that we're making a modification. It's, it's um, making a call to, to not do that project and move the, the funds to a different location. But I think you're right that uh, it would be hard pressed to get that project done in time for this. Because we'd have to be done and complete and invoices by April of uh, 2026. So there, there may be the possibility to do the, the slab repair, but not the overlay necessarily. So we may have to break that out into to pieces. But we could, there are se segments of that that we may be able to get done in that time frame. And the reason that we wouldn't put a project like the Park, uh, Park Boulevard slab repair in this is because of the cost or because you don't think that it's going to be considered by them? So if I can offer a suggestion, I think Mr. Israelson asked the question, how much does this represent? It's 50 or 65 million, depending on how you slice it. So the question is, this is actually going to be money that we would use that would displace that project and not have to use it. That would still give us the opportunity with those funds that are displaced to do the projects that you're talking about. So it's, it's not like we wouldn't do the other projects. It's, if it's not on the list, it does, it's not saying it won't get done. It'll get done anyway. I know. I, I realize that. I'm just saying there's other things on this list that I think would not be as much of a priority as getting park done. And I, I, I see what you're saying is that there are already funds allocated somewhere else for Park Boulevard. But in my mind, rather than adding in something like land for public works or a parking garage, it would make more sense to offset a very expensive project like Park Boulevard with these funds than adding in some of these other things. So that's why, where my question was. So Park, Park Boulevard is on our list and it's been moved up in our priority over the last six months. Um, we, we always try to stagger the number of roads that we have under construction at any given time. So part of the challenge that we had with Park Boulevard was our plans for Parker Road, which is currently uh, under construction with both the slab replacement and then we're going to be doing the overlay. And there was a section of Parker Road between Custer and Round Rock that we were talking about complete replacement. That has been reassessed and reevaluated, and we've determined that we can actually do the slab maintenance and the overlay in that area as well, rather than doing the complete, complete repair. But we try not to have uh, roads that are running parallel to another, both under construction at the same time because of the ta traffic disruption. So we're, uh, the short answer is we're trying to wait for Parker Road to be done. And as soon as it's done, we can start on Park. It's in our queue to get going. Um, but we have to let Parker Road get done so that we don't have parallel roads, um, both under construction at the same time, which is very disruptive to traffic. So it is on our list, and that's a longer, uh, a longer answer, but it is on our list to get done, and these funds would be able to be used for that. But because we're still waiting on Parker Road, it might not be done in that same time frame to, to fulfill that. Okay, my second question was on the traffic signal system. You mentioned the cabinet, the fiber optics, but I know we've been working for a long time to try to get to some of that smarter technology that allows the signals to adapt, but we needed some other technology to get to that. Where would we be, um, where are we in that and trying to get towards that? And could some of this mo mo money be used to try to get us so quicker the, towards that end? The list of elements that I gave you adds up to about $6 million out of that $20 million. That's, that's in the works too. So that doesn't get pulled off the list because this gets moved up. We're working on it simultaneously. Okay, so part of that twenty million you mentioned is that additional yeah. technology we need to fulfill that yes. goal. All of that, <clears throat> Anthony. Thank you, Mayor. 
<clears throat> and <clears throat> thank you, Jack, for that great presentation. <clears throat> uh, I think this this is uh, uh, mostly a great list. Um, a couple of points that I would raise, uh, you know, whether it's Park Boulevard or another uh, urgently needed arterial maintenance project, I, I would concur with the mayor pro tem that, you know, moving up those street maintenance projects, you know, above uh, acquiring land or, or you know, uh, building new connections, things of that nature would make sense. I, I would also uh, offer that I think uh, number two, the, the downtown parking garage and number eight, the Parker Road station connection, are uh, eligible for TERS funding. I, I could be mistaken about that, and I, you know, I don't know what the balance currently is in the TERS, but uh, I know this is essentially a reimbursement of citywide sales tax collection. So, you know, given that we have a TERS and that that you know that increment is not going into the general fund, you know, to be shared throughout the city, we have you know a dedicated revenue stream <laughs> for projects like that in in downtown. Um, I personally would favor using TERS funding for numbers two and eight, the, the parking garage and the, the Parker Road station connection and, uh, and focusing on, on these other projects. Um, and also, I'd love to see us add to this list. I noted in the, uh, the, the memo about the DART ILA that, um, that medical transportation services are eligible. And I know that something we've done with either uh, CARES Act or ARPA funding or both was to reimburse public safety salaries uh, and obviously, you know, we do medical transportation services through Plano Fire Rescue, and that, that leads to uh, salaries for firefighters and paramedics. It leads to um, equipment. It leads to apparatus, uh, you know, like ambulances and, and you know, even, uh, even the trucks and engines, you know, you see them responding to medical emergencies. So I'd love to see us add a category in for emergency medical services and, and uh, medical transportation services to see if we could uh, defray some of those expenses. And in general, uh, you know, as I've articulated before, and I know City Manager Israel Sin and I have talked about this, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to see this done in a way, and I, I think this is the intent of what you've just talked about, but I'd love to see this done in a way where we are defraying the, the expense of things that would have been done through uh, existing bond authorities so that we don't have to issue those bonds. And, you know, maybe they can be, uh, you know, that authority can be held over and I'm hoping the 2025 bond package will be smaller than it otherwise would have been as a result of being able to do some projects that would have been bond funded with uh, with these DART funds instead and thereby, you know, decrease the future property tax burden for uh, residents of Plano. So uh, anyway, with that, uh, I, I appreciate it. I, th I think it's a great list. I would uh, make those modifications of, of taking two and eight off and adding in uh, EMS or, or just the category of medical transportation services in general, but uh, but I, I appreciate the great list. So in, in response to that, I, the, the two and eight going to tours will surely evaluate that. One of the things that I need to do is, is make sure that, uh, that uh, the concept of the um, the Texas Transportation Code, the parameters that they have to spend their tax dollars, and they've given us that real tight ILA, and the terms that they use is public transportation services and complementary transportation services. And so I need to ch check to see how far, if, if we're still inside the, the, the eligibility uh, circle on, on what you're talking about. We will ask and we will push as hard as we can to do that. For sure. Well, thank you. And obviously, if they say no, I, I just saw in the memo there was a bullet point for medical transportation services. And I thought, well, you know, that's something the city does. So, you know, to preserve our flexibility, we could uh, we could include that as well if, if everyone's in, in concurrence with doing that. Councilmember Holmer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, piggybacking on what Anthony, or excuse me, Councilmember Riccadelli just said, if you took out two and eight, what would the budget look like for those other projects? So two was about uh, a little over two million dollars, and eight was three hundred and fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's as someone who has expressed interest in additional parking in downtown in the past, I'd like to revisit my thinking on that. Um, as a former merchant down there, I know we struggled with it. And really, the, the struggle with parking isn't the lack of parking, it's a lack of awareness as to where the parking is. And so, you know, that being said, I had an appointment down here, and there's plenty of parking at City Hall when I came down and didn't have any trouble, especially nights and weekends. I'm a little concerned about a few different things about that parking garage. Um, First, it's just a prime location. I think there's other things that might serve us better there. I am concerned about 
issues that might arise from the city being responsible for a parking garage. I'm also worried about potential uh, use of the parking garage for transient um, purposes for people sleeping there, and it may be increasing potential crime in downtown. So I just wanted to express that, that I know I was one of the, probably the biggest proponents of we want more parking downtown. Um, really, I believe we do have a lot of parking. I think we just need to do a better job educating people as to where it is. So I just wanted to be on the record saying I don't necessarily think that's the best use right now. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. So Jack, let me, let me just, in my head, summarize. So this, this money that's coming back from DART, this $28 million that is um, coming back to us, is really our sales tax dollars that is uh, overflow and they're reimbursed it back to us, in essence? Yeah, it, it's actually uh, sales that occurred in Plano. The money went directly to Austin and then directly to DART without passing through us. But yes, it... it that it one was, cent that went were, to, um, yeah, we our one, one cent of sales tax that went to the state, went to DART, and then now DART says, well, we're giving it back to you. <coughs> they have unspent sales tax, yes. And so basically that's indirectly, that's our one cent sales tax that we're getting back. But at this point, DART is saying, you can have it back, but you have to spend it on these specific items and we have very strict rules about what you can and cannot spend it on. Is that right? That's pretty close. And so these projects, these eight projects, basically um, is, is put together based on the criteria that has been um, set forth by DART. Am I right about that? That is correct. Again, they're following the Texas Transportation Code and the parameters that they have to abide by, but they're actually embedding that into the interlocal agreement that, that ties our hands. Okay. And so at this point, there is no priority. I mean, you listed eight projects, but there's no priority at this time with regard to what we want first, right? That's correct. And I'm hearing some discussion about projects that need to move down or find a different funding source. So, but even if we want certain priority, it still has to go to DART for approval? Oh, yes. It's, this is going to be an iterative process. Me bringing it to you, talking to DART, they say yes or no, and bringing it back, put it in the ILA, and then 12 months of uh, may, possibly other projects or changes. Yes. So that means even if we want this to be the number one top priority, let's say, you know, getting the, the roads done in, on park, and we submit that to DART, and we say, this is what we really, really, really want, um, they could still say no? They have, they're in control. I mean, Mark, help me out. We could send you to that meeting. The, the IOA is, is. Yeah, send me to the meeting. Yeah, the, the <laughs> IOA is heavily slanted towards DART approval, but they are, they are trying to find ways with cities to make sure that transportation related projects are being approved. There's yeah, some negotiation occurring behind the scenes. So. I, I am quite concerned that we're, when we're using our own dollars that we are being um, told that we have to go by their priorities rather than our priorities. But however, I understand that you, the city staff is doing the best they can in trying to advocate for our interests. Um, however, I, I also believe that, um, you know, after probably surveying the council members, putting together a priority list and really emphasize those ones that we believe should go first is the most um, um, best, the best way to use our funds. Our funds, really. Thank you. Councilmember Smith. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, in, in terms of kind of narrowing things down, the there's four here that I would, I would like to recommend, I think uh, because of the time frame that they could be some of them be done within uh, and the dollar amount. So three, four, seven, and eight could be the ones that, that, that I would suggest. Uh, the, the traffic signal, uh, as I think you know, Mayor Protiba, extremely important to me. I mean, there's nothing that, that jams the city up more than having traffic signals not working. We, we've done a great job. I mean, I'll put that whole Spring Creek HEB lighting system we put in up there. 
I was worried about that, but you guys pull it off. I mean, it's 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 flawless. It worked great. So I think, you know, we want to continue down that track. And, and you know, I do notice and I get comments about that that uh, to to improve the, uh, the the just in time or the need when there's traffic sitting here, lights green going this way. There's not a person in sight, and they're sitting sitting to being able to see that. You know, with the the improved technology and get traffic moving where there is traffic. I think that that's going to be that would be a great that would be a great plus. And then, lastly, I just want to say and I'm not sure if it was city manager or, or if it's you, but we'll, we'll give both of y'all credit. I just I, I have had great comments on the nighttime arterial overlay doing the work at night and not snagging up traffic during the day. Brilliant. So let, let's keep being imaginative and do things like that on, that on some of these projects. Dan Printer guest. Yeah. Dan, we'll, we'll, we'll bless give it to you. Dan. Brilliant, brilliant move, thanks. I've, I've heard many great things about that too. Jensen. Uh, yes, Paige, just Jack, I, um, if possible, I would like to see the price tags for each of these proposals, um, unless I miss something in email. Um, no, we uh, intentionally talked about these being categories because arterial straight street maintenance, if that's all you wanted to do, we could actually load up, uh, yeah. Mr. Printer gas has given me a, a and that's fair a budget for that. He says I can spend thirty million dollars on that. So if okay. that is your one and only, we could do that. And that's fair. Then then for the things that would have a definitive price tag. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Like the parking garage, exactly, exactly. and the and the station connection. Yeah. Thank you. We'll do it. Councilmember Grady. I feel left out because I didn't have an opportunity to talk. <laughs> I'm just trying to follow the money on this. Um, uh, I have the inference that if uh, the sales tax money goes to Austin and is given to DART, it really is for transportation needs. And that is why it is defined as transportation needs rather than you can use it for anything else. If I'm correct. That is 100% correct. All right. So um, parking garage. Um, I, I believe at one time um, there was discussion of a parking garage being funded by RTC money at the Cullen Creek Mall. And when that didn't flow through, um, it was moved to the thought of using the dollars in downtown Plano for a parking garage. But I believe at some point in time, those funds may have been returned to the RTC. So we never received the funds. But if I can go all the way back to the Cullen Creek project, mm -hmm. that was federal money yes. for that project. And because it was federal money, it had so many strings attached to it, we couldn't pull it off in time. In fact, at one of the RTC meetings, you heard parking garages that they now figured out they don't use federal money, they use local money for that very reason. But we were the the guinea pig that figured it out. So. Okay, okay, so really the the thought of a downtown parking garage, if it, we were to do something of that nature, would have to come out of these funds. The RTC funds will not be available for that. All right, good, thank you. Well, my thoughts are, once again, uh, you guys have spent a lot of time and you know areas of need. And that's why number one, two, three, four, five through eight are on there because these are all needs. This is a journey. I'd love to say there's gonna be a destination one day, but this city will always be a journey and will always have needs. Uh, with just the infrastructure of 200 plus million dollars, the public works complex is necessary and it's certainly inadequate at this point. So I, I would like, in, however you guys wanna mix them up, that's fine, but I would like to submit all these because they came from you and they came from staff in their direction of what the real needs were and all these could be considered transportation. So. Um, I, I think all the council has, has given great ideas on how these things can be used, but at the end of the day, we'll have to submit them, and a lot of these will be knocked out. Some of them will, and uh, so uh, I, I think I think we should really offer them all up on the first glance, 
and, and see what comes back and, uh, and then be able to just kind of decipher it from that point on. So mayor and council, we, we are seeking direction. And so we need, we need to make sure that we're clear on this because if, if we submit these eight, um, again, uh, you've heard, we have some more flexibility in a couple of these than others. Arterial street maintenance is, is one of those that we have, um, obviously we're being very aggressive, uh, with the maintenance of our streets and it's our intention to, to stay that way for a while until we get, uh, our arterial program, uh, where we want it to be. Um, but there are some that have larger price tags than others. So we're fine with moving forward with all eight and including those and taking those to um, DART and getting uh, the official thumbs up that we can go forward with that. That would require additional uh, authorization and appropriation coming back to council saying these are the projects we'd like to get started on, but that might allow us to work with that timeline a little bit more as well to refine that to make sure that we're working with that. Jack? Yeah, and just one more thing, if I can add on the end of that. Uh, we have the ILA that will be coming back before this group for consideration. I think it was our discussion to have these projects listed Correct. with that ILA. So it gives you another bite at this uh, discussion. Council Member Williams. <clears throat> I want to get clarification. The list that we submit to DART, is that getting price tag approval or conceptual approval for the nature of the project? So for instance, if DART comes, if DART says, well, it's a no-go on the land for the public works complex, but the arterial street maintenance is okay and the parking garage is okay. Could we, if we so chose, plow all the money into the arterial street maintenance? Or are they approving price tag by price tag itemization for the items? Our, our intent with the ILA was to get uh, categorical approval and then to work through project by project on specific dollar amounts. So if council so chose, and, and honestly, it might make it easier for us if you all said, we want it to all go to arterial maintenance, we'll plow through a, a lot of those funds. But there are some other strategic decisions in front of you, council, that will have a, a budgetary and a capital impact at some point in our future. Not, all of these elements, to some extent, are going to be decisions for council, whether in the near future or, you know, not too distant future. Um, these will all be decisions for council that will have a budgetary or capital impact. But as far as the number of projects that we submit, we could refine this list down to three, four, five if we wanted to uh, and hone in on those dollar amounts. As it stands right now, these are categories that we can bring back with specific price tags and let council approve those uh, on a going forward basis. Okay, I was just trying to get a sense for the level of uh, finalization you're seeking tonight from us. So mm -hmm. it looks like you're just asking, are we okay with presenting these as options to DART and DART will check yes, yes, no, yes, no. And then it's up to us on what we wanna move forward on out of the pool of yeses. Correct. Okay. Council Member Riccadilly. Thank you, Mayor. Um, with that clarification that Council Member Williams just obtained, you know, that just putting something on this list doesn't mean that we're obligated to do it if DART says yes. We just, we, we have permission to do it, but we're not obligated to do it. I think I'd be okay submitting all eight, seeing what yeses uh, come back. Obviously, I, I, you know, articulated my thoughts about source of funds on two and eight, and that's not likely to change, but you know, I'm certainly willing to keep an open mind and submit these to DART. I would encourage us just in that spirit of getting as many yeses from DART as we can to add that ninth category relating to EMS, uh, unless we think for sure it's just not going to get approved because again, I saw that medical transportation services uh, bullet point in, in the ILA memo. If there's a chance that that could be a permit, permitted use also, um, that would give us even more flexibility, you know, and we could make that decision later. But if DART says no, they say no. But anyway, so I, I, I would encourage us to do that. But uh, I, guess I think we're fine with, with researching that. The, the okay. challenge that we've had with this, and I'll, I'll just be candid, is to apply it to salaries is probably going to be a stretch for what we've heard initially from gotcha. them. Um, when you talk about transportation, mm -hmm. it's more of a contracted transportation service than a um, reimbursement for the provision of that. So, but we'll be happy to research okay, that gotcha. and we'll, we'll yeah. double check that, um, that we're on the same page. Jack has a, a great resource at DART for us to be able to check that sure. out. Sure. And if it, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I just wanted to make sure we, we run that, uh, down and get an answer. So thank you guys for that. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm good with submitting this whole list except for number two, just based on discussions 
we've had in the past about this. I don't sense there's a lot of support for that amongst this council. I could be wrong, but because of that, I just don't know that it's worth submitting that one because we're only submitting the actual um, pur purchase of the land, correct? correct? And then that comes back to us for the large cost of building it and then the operation and maintenance of it, which would also be very large. So that's why I'm really not supportive of two. If y'all want to do a quick hand vote as far as including or excluding two, we could do that. That'll provide us the clarity and then we can move forward with the rest of the list. So if <laughs> I've, I've, that makes number four. So I think that we have our instructions that we'll, re, we'll remove uh, item number two. Thank you. All right, we'll pull it off the list for now. All right, thank you, Jack. Thank you. Next item is consent and regular uh, agendas. Any item council member would like to remove? Any items for future agendas? Uh, yes, Mayor, just uh, one quick one. I'd like to take a look at adding an option, uh, certainly not mandatory, but an option for residents to include their phone number <coughs> and email address when they submit zoning case feedback. That way, um, you know, if they want to be available for questions from council members or PNZ members regarding the feedback that they provided, uh, we have an easy way to get a hold of them. Council, I just re remind y'all that those records are open records. Those are public documents that would be searchable for vendors and for other folks. So uh, that personal information um, does become part of that public record. So while we can put it on there as an optional uh, entry, it does create that ability for people to be searched um, and found, including their cell phone number. So that may be um, something that, if optional, does not find much uh, use, but just making sure y'all are aware. That's uh, how about uh, alternatively uh, providing a link to the council's contact information from the form? Sure, I, I think that could work. What I was going to put on the agenda, and, and no, maybe nobody else thinks it's a good idea, in which case it will just uh, go away. But, uh, but you know, I, I thought it would be good. You know, sometimes you read the, the three sentences of feedback and you think, wait, tell me more, you know, about this, this traffic issue or this, uh, y you know, you're concerned about, you know, this curb cut or you're concerned about water drainage and, you know, you want to reach out to somebody and, you know, get the details and there's no way to, uh, to reach out to somebody based on that zoning uh, feedback form. So, um, which I guess, I guess we could just say, Hey, if they, if they want to reach out to us, they can do that. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know, per personally, I, I, I would find it helpful to have contact info if people want to voluntarily mm -hmm. provide that. So I just wanted to put a discussion of that on a, future agenda, but if, if nobody wants to, then... Uh, I'd be okay having the start. discussion, but I think it's a valid concern. We'll, we'll have that discussion. All right. We'll take a recess and return at 7 o'clock.
I now declare that the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Peyton Coker, Minister of the Young Singles with Prestonwood Baptist Church, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge led by the Boys and Girls Clubs of Collin County, Plano. Would you please rise? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we gather here tonight, and Lord, before we make decisions and cast votes and talk through different things going on in our city, God, we just pause to give you praise because you're the one true God in heaven, the one who reigns, who is uh, full of love, and you show us that love in so many different ways, but chiefly in your son, Lord Jesus, that you would send him to die and to uh, raise victoriously in life so that we can have life and salvation only in you, King Jesus. And I pray for anyone in the room today that doesn't know you, that they would know you soon and very soon. But specifically, I lift up these leaders, Mayor Munns and the rest of the council, that as they make decisions for our city, Lord, that you would guide them, uh, that you would give them wisdom and the knowledge that is necessary to do what your word tells us to do, that se to seek the benefit and the welfare of our city. Lord Jesus, we ask for your help in all these things. And it's your name we pray. Amen. I do. I do. Hold on, guys. Hold on. I got something for you. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you so much. Okay. Right here in front of this, and you guys all stand right here. Oh, you guys look great today. Okay. All right, come over here. There you go. All right. Wait. Come. You come. You come back here with me. You're too tall. Come here. Come here. You're fine. All right. We're all together now. Thank you. Thanks. We got we got your point to come. Are we being able to ask a question? If you 
you want to stay for the whole meeting, after that, we can talk about everything. Okay? But right now, we got to keep going. So thank you guys for doing the play. Y'all are the best. Thank you so much. But you're welcome. That looks like your regular picture. That looks like your regular picture. You did wonderful. You did great. You like knew all the words. Yeah, you guys are all. Are y'all others? Well, you want a high five? Yeah, I think that's probably better. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, ask Mansoor Karimi to come down to uh, take the oath of office for the board. And let me get this right. Is this the Board of Adjustment? Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Let me read you the uh, oath of office. The city of Plano and this council take the opportunity to hear from our citizens very seriously. Wrong, wrong <laughs> script. <laughs> <laughs> Am I in trouble? <laughs> it's, it's a really good script, but it's not the right one. <laughs> Woo. All right. <laughs> Matsur, do you solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the duties of the Board of Adjustment of the City of Plano, Texas, and will, to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and of this state and the charter and ordinances of this city. And you furthermore solemnly swear that you have not directly or indirectly paid, offered, or promised to pay, contributed, nor promised to contribute any money or valuable thing or promised any public office or employment as a reward to secure your appointment so help you God. I do. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, Thank you for serving. All right, we'll move on to comments of public interest. And one thing, I, I just want to say one thing before we get started. This is what I was supposed to read now. <laughs> so the city of Plano and the council take the opportunity to hear from our citizens very seriously. We always welcome feedback on how we can make our community better. We take seriously our role as the city government and the importance of respecting our citizens' time and taxpayer resource, and we strive to conduct ourselves with excellence and focus our agenda on city business. And in return, we ask that those that come before us provide the same level of respect. Thank you. Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The council may not discuss these items, but may respond with factual or policy information. The council may choose to place the item on a future agenda. And I do have two speakers this evening. The first one is Shannon Hawkins. First, I'd like to say good evening to everyone, to all of city council members. Happy New Year's to you all. I first want to say thank you for coming into our community. Um, you guys came into our community and you asked the citizens to show up at a school. We all showed up and we gave our advice and some of the issues that we were having in our community. Since then, we have noticed that there has been a lot of help. Things have diminished and we appreciate that. However, my family and I are still dealing with a lot of issues as far as our utilities being used in our home, uh, such as our refrigerator, our uh, AC and heating unit, even when it's turned off. Um, there are chemicals that are being excreted into our home as if there is an effort to get rid of our family. 
This has been ongoing for over two years now. And like I said, things have diminished. And when things diminish, that means there is a capability of it stopping altogether. So what we are asking is, without me having to go into the logistics so that I don't you know, make the city of Plano look terrible, I would like to speak to a city council member in private, along with my family, so that we can discuss further some of the issues that has been going. It's very disturbing. I watched my mother break down today. She finally had her break today. And it's a lot. It plays a lot on the mental. There's a lot of traffic coming in around our home, uh, posting up around our home while we're sleeping, drumming up. Anytime we get on our cell phone to use the Wi-Fi, it's taking our cell phone data. Whoever these people are that has been placed in the community is very terroristic. I would not come to you and tell you these things if it is not a serious concern for my family. And we do need your help. And that's all I have to say tonight. Again, thank you guys for your time. Uh, I left my phone number and the address, and my family and I are very much willing to speak with you guys. God bless you all. Have a thank day. you. The next speaker is James Lockridge. Hello, Mr. Mums. How are you? City Council. Guys, I come today because the uh, city of Plano actually went out and did something, and they did something that was wrong. They had code compliance go to every landowner in the city and force them to mow crops, land, or whatever they could get mowed to get their setback. Today, I have a letter that was sent to the AG's office describing what has happened in the city of Plano. Now, Farmer's Branch, as unless y'all did not see on Channel 11, we won. They lost. It's going to cost them. Now it's going to cost y'all. I've asked y'all to come table. Not but one city council member has talked to me. Not but one. I have a problem with that. This little episode that y'all played here just the other day, making everybody mow everything, just me alone cost me 55 acres of farmland. 55 acres of farmland is what the city of Plano has cost me. Do you know how much money that is out of my pocket? Out of other people's pockets. Where's your food supply going to come from? I don't think y'all really care. So on this letter, it says very clearly, Plano municipality have adopted ordinances and zoning restrictions that is negatively impacting the use of open space land for agricultural. These ordinances are arbitrary, discriminatory, and unnecessary to abate the nuisance or threat to public health and safety. And in municipalities that are subject to the provision of Section 25105 of the Agricultural Code, the requirements of the state of that statute have not been followed in adopting ordinances regulating agricultural operations. Municipalities required a private person to maintain the city right of way with their personal and private resources. In this inverse condemnation due to requiring someone to use their property, money and equipment for public purpose without compensation. Municipality arbitrary placed a burden on agricultural operations to abate nuisance and threats to public health by restricting generally accepted agricultural practices without proving, providing evidence that this is the basis of the finding that the ordinance is not necessary or is necessary, particularly when there are not restrictions placed on other property owners to abate the same nuisance to the threat, uh, nuisance or threat to the public, i.e. restrictions on residential landscaping to abate insects, vermins, and compared to the restrictions placed on vegetation on open space land. So guys, that's a letter went to the AG's office. The state reps are pushing hard and we're pushing back. We are sick and tired of y'all taking everything that belongs to us. What are we gonna do? Where's your food gonna come from? Leave us alone, back your law off and let us do what we need to do. That's all we're asking for. Mr. Mumps, I'd love to sit down and talk with you. It's been almost a year, nothing. I'd love to have a meeting with you to help get this under control. Thank you, sir.
There are no other speakers. To the consent agenda. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual discussion by a council member, the city manager, or any citizen. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests. Motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. <clears throat> second. I have a motion a second to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Next item. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer amend, may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for <coughs> items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in order the requests were received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Num item number one, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2022-12 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city Ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended, so as to rezone 2.8 acres of land located on the south side of Los Rios Boulevard, 224 feet <coughs> east of Flintstone Drive in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, from Plan Development 320 Estate Development to Single Family Residence 9, and to amend ordinance number 2000. 9-5-17 and specific use permit 598 for daycare center to reduce the area covered by the permit from 3.9 acres to 1.8 acres due to the removal of the affected portion of the subject property from the permitted area. Directing changes accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and Executives. I'm Christina Day, the Director of Planning, and I'm here to talk about Zoning Case 2022-12 this evening. Uh, the purpose of this request is to rezone a portion of an existing lot that is partially developed with a daycare center. Um, that would allow the development of six new single-family residential lots. And the request is to change the zoning from PD 320 uh, which includes a number of various zoning districts, but this area is a state development to straight single family nine zoning. It would also rescind the existing SUP from that property. So the graphic in front of you shows the property in question where the residential would be developed and the notice areas surrounding that property. The blue line indicates a 200 foot uh, legal notice boundary under state law and the red line indicates an additional notice up to 500 feet that is required by Plano's zoning ordinance. The yellow line on the map shows an, uh, the property on an aerial showing the development of the surrounding property. So you can see the existing daycare center, a religious institution that is developed to the south, as well as uh, the remaining development are all single family homes in this area. This is a concept plan um, outlined in blue are the residential lots that could be developed based on the proposed zoning classification. You can see there are six lots proposed, the largest uh, lot being over 16,000 square feet and the smallest lot being 9,000 square feet. This is the modification to the existing daycare center. You see uh, it will be uh, modified slightly, and I have another uh, graphic on that, but they are rerouting some of their, changing their parking lot slightly and modifying their uh, playground area, area at the rear of their site to accommodate the new development. So the zoning history in this area, in 1984, the subject property was part of a zoning case. Um, a, a large zoning case that rezoned 
the general area. It was a plan development that included three different residential zoning classifications. Um, however, those didn't those specific zoning classifications didn't exist the way they do today in the ordinance. In 1986, the whole zoning ordinance was rewritten, and the classifications as you see them today um, were put into place. So, single family residence seven, single family residence nine, and estate development. Um, that stayed pretty much the same until 2008 when a specific use permit was granted for daycare center number 598 it was established on a portion of the property and then just the next year the SUP was expanded to include the remainder of the subject property however that expansion was never built so regarding the comprehensive plan uh, the Action number one under the redevelopment and growth management policy does state explicitly that we will review zoning change requests for consistency with the future land use map and dashboards. This property is within the neighborhood's future land use area on the map. It's currently classified as an institutional type due to the daycare center proposed use and the SUP that exists on the property. So it would make modifications to employment types and increase housing types should this zoning case be approved. Uh, you can see the modifications to the housing mix in the table above, 71.0%, uh, and that would, because the changes are so small, the area is so small, it's a negligible increase in the percentage at a tenth of a percent does not change um, for any of the housing mix types. Um, you have to get down to the thousandth percent to make to notice the change. Uh, with regard to the dashboard, the request is compliant with all the different dashboard categories: um, height, density, intensity, open space. There's specific details in the plan that talk about small developments um, should not be burdened with maintenance of uh, specific open space through a HOA. And so it's therefore uh, in compliance there. Uh, parking, block pattern, all these things are in compliance. Additional policies were mentioned um, under re redevelopment and growth management and undeveloped land policy in the staff report. Both of those were found in compliance. So all in all, uh, the comprehensive plan, we did not find any non-compliance within the comprehensive plan. The specific use permit for daycare center, we've shown the existing layout based on the most recently approved substantially conforming site plan on the left. The proposed layout, including the new residential development, is on the right. Um, so you see there will be modifications to the site, including removal of the fire lane turnaround um, on the northern side of the building that exists today. Responses to this case, there is a uh, requirement under state law that allows uh, individuals that respond with a signed letter to have uh, legal rights um, to protest zoning cases. And so we did, we do mail out letters to individuals within 200 feet. We received one letter back and that person indicated they were neutral to the change. Um, and that is 17.7% of the buffer area. We did not receive letters from any of the other individuals within the notice area. However, we did receive unique responses from 43 individuals. Uh, there were 55 total responses received. Um, 12 of those were either repeat or updated responses um, that we received over time. 41 were in opposition one was neutral and one was in support. And because this zoning case was re-noticed, it was originally noticed at single family seven, but after working with the neighborhood, uh, they actually um, modified and we re-noticed for single family nine. Eight of those addresses, um, sorry, nine responses were included after that new notice went out. Um, one being neutral and eight in opposition. So those are the numbers after the re-notice. 
The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval of this case by a vote of seven to zero. With that, I am available for questions you might have on this case. Any questions for staff? Councilman Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Christine, I've, I've been out and, and, and looked at the uh, uh, the site. I mean, I'm I'm all for more housing. You know, when, when we can make that work. Uh, the question I have, and I noticed here on the joint that we were showing a couple of uh, unobstructive view uh, marks here. The, the the problem I have right now, the way that that site is situated is to, to, to me it's a, it's I see a real uh, potential safety hazard for traffic coming uh, southbound on Los Rios from, from Parker with those hedges there so it, it, was there any consideration given or uh, any discussion about uh, how those hedges could be eliminated to give to give like full view when you're you know you're coming down those rails because I'm telling you you drive out there by the time you you get to the end of that row of hedges you'd be right there on on the uh, where that drive is going to be exiting out onto Los Rios right the concept plan that was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission does show removal of the hedges um, it shows a 348 foot unobstructed view um, so that does meet we have what's called a visibility and maintenance uh, easement requirement through the engineering department they look at angles and uh, look basically draw back the sight line distance from an intersection and so this plan would not have been recommended for approval if it didn't meet that sight line distance requirement okay so it would only be this uh uh, it says plus or minus 50 feet of hedges removed. Okay. It, does, so. it shows that if the hedges are removed, there's an additional 400, it's 415 feet instead of, so it's basically an additional roughly 65 feet of available view if you remove the hedges. Okay. But, but as far as we know, if, uh, if this were to be approved, that the city, we would only be able to require that that 50 foot of, of hedges uh, be uh, be removed Is that correct I think that we are saying it meets the ordinance the way it exists today with the hedges but we would we would require them to remove any hedges that obstructed the view as it is stands in the ordinance to meet the city standards gotcha and, and I know the other thing looking you know looking at the plan here the, the plat that uh, I mean it makes sense to have the you know the entry of the cul-de-sac in, in the middle of the lot but again, the problem is, is that that closeness to that to that blind curve there. Uh, yes. Was there any other plant given to us that had something pushing the drive closer to down to where the drive already is for the entrance to the daycare? Or, I mean, I know that that may not be, it doesn't look may not be very feasible. But I just wonder if any consideration was given to to moving that around that we saw in in the initial stages. Right, I, I am not aware of consideration that applicant may talk about studies that they've done to move they do need a turn lane uh, coming right. into the cul-de-sac so they'll have to have the distance requirements enough um, distance to meet from tree shadow trail to the uh, median cut that they're proposing there so um, in that regard they have to make the median work for both directions so it will be um, I don't know that there's a substantial amount of opportunity to move the street. Okay, and the applicant's here tonight, I assume, yes. so we can ask them. Okay, great, thank you. Certainly. Mayor Pro Tem. So can you go back and say again what you said about some of these opposition comments being submitted before there were changes? What, what were they responding to? So the original zoning request was for single family seven zoning. <clears throat> And the applicant can speak to this directly, but they went and worked with the homeowners association, came back and revised the request to single family nine, so larger lots. They lost a lot. Originally, it was going to be seven lots instead of six. So it was a modified request, not just for the zoning, but the number of lots was reduced by one. And so we re-noticed the zoning case for single family nine rather than single family seven. And so since the time that that re-notice occurred, we received nine 
uh, responses rather than, and so everything prior to that was um, under the single family seven. And that's why you'll see in some of the comments, people referring to R, R7, that's why that was the original notice. But there's several of them that are referring to apartments. That that was just confusion on their part? I believe that was confusion. This was never proposed as an apartment development. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, the overarching concern I have regarding the curve is for anybody coming um, <clears throat> uh, eastbound on Los Rios, that estate right there, um, just before the proposed development, <clears throat> there's not only uh, hedges, but a wall. And even if those weren't obstacles, once this development is complete, there's gonna be a house, according to the concept plan, right at the top of that curve, <clears throat> obscuring any visibility to uh, the exit from this uh, tiny little subdivision. Um, I'm very concerned about the uh, safety there. Um, anybody who's coming the opposite direction of Los Rios and wants to turn in, I think they'll have enough visibility because they'll be already be on the uh, north side of Los Rios. <clears throat> but I am very concerned about anybody pulling out from the subdivision onto Los Rios. Um, now I understand from the site plan, there's gonna be a little median cut <clears throat> um, or a cut in the median so that people could turn left. Um, and I don't think that, I think I don't think anybody turning left would have the same issues from uh, north and westbound traffic um, just because the visibility going to the east isn't doesn't seem to be much of an issue. Um, but anybody pulling out of there is going to have, as best I can tell, about 50 foot warning um, before traffic heading around the curve eastbound on Los Rios um, comes on them. Um, do we have we evaluated that? Yes, from, that is <clears throat> with yeah. the 2B state, like assuming that there will be a house there and the accompanying fence and everything. <clears throat> yes, engineering has reviewed this plan. They look at it. There are design standards uh, that the city has for, um, <clears throat> we do not allow driveways that would obstruct visibility based on angle. So they <clears throat> do an analysis where they look at the driveway that's proposed. It's a required sight line distance based on city standards. <clears throat> and this, based on the required setback of 20 feet, meets those standards. So that it does meet the city's sightline criteria based on our engineering transportation standards. Okay, and what what is that sightline from that angle? It, it <clears throat> states on the plan that there is a 348 foot unobstructed view from the uh, proposed street. Okay. Back to the Northwest. Maybe I'm just a poor judge of distance, but it doesn't seem that you could get that past the estate. Let's let's hear from the yeah. Let's move on. <clears throat> okay, and here get the information. All right. Any other questions for staff? You have a question? I do. Okay, yes. Thank, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a, a a quick one. Uh, so on the the sight line issue. Certainly, I'll defer to the engineering department, but just from a, a belt and suspenders point of view, would we as a city be able to put up a sign that says approaching intersection, you know, a yellow sign that may, maybe with flashing lights? I mean, that that would seem to make sure that even if, you know, somebody was going too fast, you know, or, or whatever the case may be, they would be very aware that an intersection's approaching, even if they didn't, you know, keep a lookout. So I'd Right. Um, I think we could do something like this. The Transportation Engineering Department, we asked them for data on this area, and there are, in this section of Los Rios Boulevard, there are um, 5,983 trips on our last traffic volume map, and they did provide accident data to us as well. Um, the Transportation engineer I spoke with, or emailed rather, um, said this was basically, this area was average for reported crashes. So um, that was their assessment of the situation here, that it was, it was not a high accident location. It was just 
what she would normally expect to see based on the speed and the volume of traffic. <clears throat> uh, but just to be clear, and, and thank you for that information, Christina. So we, we could add a stipulation on this zoning case that there's going to be such a sign, you know, you know, a, a, an approaching intersection or whatever the sign should say type of sign there on the road? Um, I, I don't want to commit for the engineering oh, department sorry, because sorry. I, okay. I, I don't know. I think they could do something like that, but um, that would not... I might defer to the city manager as oh, okay, whether gotcha. he wants gotcha. to do something along those lines. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that information, Christina. Just want to let you all know, playing with Google Maps, it looks like it's about 350 feet. Okay. Councilman McGrady. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there are several curves in this city that have signs that say approaching a street that is blind and this would not be the only one in the city i can i can tell you there is one on hedgecoaks i know exactly where it is mm -hmm. i know exactly the street that they're talking about there's also one on ridgeview so this is not the first time that we've had a curved street where traffic engineering has had to put up a sign to warn drivers that there is an exit or there is a street there on the curve okay thank you the applicant like to address the council? Hi, I'm Scott Remfrey at 8305 Catawba Road in Dallas, Texas, 75209. I am the uh, partner on this project, uh, president of Bright Tar Companies that manages the development of this. So we've, uh, we've gone over this with the engineering department and our civil engineer for the last, uh, probably, I guess it's almost been a year now, and gone through all of this and designed it uh, accordingly. We originally had looked at doing uh, R7, and we met with the homeowners groups several times and with the staff, uh, backed off to an R9, and based upon the, the, uh, the acreage we have, we really could have done uh, eight or nine lots on here based upon our, our zoning or our, our, our acreage, excuse me, to get to R9. We ended up backing off and we went to seven lots, as, as she mentioned, and now we're at six, and the average lot size is 13,290 square feet apiece, which are really large lots. There's one lot that's 9,000 square feet. And so we, we've really backed off a lot, and it, uh, it's kind of a good transition from the estate lots to ours, which are almost 14,000 feet, and on into the R7s across the street. So uh, we agreed to uh, uh, revise the median and put a left turn lane as, you, as you're going left, or, or east, excuse me. So uh, I think we've accommodated everybody we could as we uh, designed this with our engineers and the staff at the city of Plano. So we'd appreciate uh, you uh, approving this. and. Appreciate and advance your consideration of this tonight. I'm around for questions, and Rob Baldwin with Baldwin Planning will, will come up here as well. He's been handling this for us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Any questions for the applicant? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I did, I did have one. Thank you. So I, I watched the uh, uh, video of the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting on this. And uh, at that time, there was mention of conversations with the Stony Hollow Residents Association. Yes. I believe it was John Marlowe, the, the president of that association. And uh, it sounded like there had been progress in those discussions, but he had not yet uh, written in anything changing his, his prior feedback. Um, in looking at the response packet we got this afternoon, I still didn't see anything changing that. Do you know, have there been further discussions there? Do, do you guys know what the status of that is? Or? In any I, word on that? I'll let Rob talk to that because we, we, we were through with Rob. He enjoyed, he liked the six lots, he liked that was laid out. Yeah. We had designs around, but there was, there was uh, separation requirements for each entrance and exit off of Los Rios. We've, we've already closed on the property. We've already opened the school as a guidepost Montessori school, which is an international Montessori school with 120 locations worldwide. So they're open. I think they only have 60 students there. So there was a huge demand for, for the, the Montessori school there. So that's a good start. Good evening. Rob Baldwin, 3904 Elm Street, Suite B in Dallas. I'm sorry, Council Member, I didn't hear what the question was. Uh, certainly, sorry, I didn't have my, my microphone on. It was just, uh, 
Have there been any further uh, discussions with the Stony Hollow Residents Association since the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting? Or No, sir. We've worked extensively with John Marlowe, who's a great guy. Um, when we first came in with uh, a much denser plan, he told us that wasn't really in the neighborhood's best interest nor in our best interest, so we modified it to where we ultimately what we've seen today. Uh, as uh, Mr. Renfrey said, we've gone with city staff. We've probably, I think we're on our eighth or ninth iteration of the site plan, working through engineering and planning to address the, the concerns with site distance and uh, driveway location, circulation between us and the school. But uh, the short answer is, uh, no, we've, we have spoken with John since uh, with the first city, uh, the PNC meeting, but we've not met. Okay, thank you. And, and just to kind of, uh close the loop on that. Uh, when you spoke with him after the PNZ meeting, did he articulate any remaining concerns about the about the the uh, proposed rezoning? He did not have any okay. additional concerns. Okay. okay. And you know, if John had concerns, he would let you know. <laughs> okay, sure. And w when you say any additional concerns, you, you mean all of his concerns had been addressed as far as you could tell? Best of my knowledge, okay. yes, sir. Okay. Th thank you for that update. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. I'll close the meeting and confine the comments to the council. Motion to approve as it's presented. Second. I have Second. A my mic. <laughs> second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to approve agenda item number one. Any other comments? Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Next item. Item number two, public hearing and consideration of a resolution to <clears throat> adopt the 2022-2023 Home American Rescue Plan allocation and proposed use of funds for program year 2022 to 2023 designating the city manager as chief executive officer and authorizing an authorized representative of the city for purposes of executing the contract consistent with this resolution, giving required assurances, acting in connection with said contract, and providing required information and providing an effective date, and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Good evening, Mayor Council, City Executives. My name is Jeanette Eden. I'm here to discuss this draft home ARP allocation plan before you um, and also for you all to hold the public hearing. I um, want to make sure that you all know the plan as it's written is written in a HUD template. So everything you see, the manner in which the budget even is written, is written in the way that HUD is requiring us to submit that data to them. And also when you're looking at the plan, there's data that's mentioned in here. Um, the data that's mentioned in here is using either point in time count or our approved HUD 2020-2024 consolidated plan data. All right. So we've mentioned this before. I'm going to just remind you that looking at the activities that are being proposed in this draft allocation plan tonight, um, they are going to be spent on households here in Plano that have an area median income of 50% or below. What that means is within this red box. So we're talking about a family of four that makes approximately $48,700 a year that will qualify for the use of these funds. So how are we going to use these funds? Well, when I spoke to you all at the preliminary open meeting on October 24th, um, you all gave me guidance and direction on how the funds should be used. And that is what you see before you. So I'm going to go through these activities one by one as HUD calls them. So the first one, the majority of the funds are going to be spent on support services. Support services is homelessness prevention. This program is not going to be operated by City of Plano staff. So when you're looking at this $1,468,051, it's going all to a nonprofit to administer this program. Um, and knowing that it's homelessness prevention, that means that the person already has a home. This activity, this program, is to keep somebody that already has a home, meaning they already have a lease in their name, in their home. It's to prevent them from becoming homeless. Um, 
As proposed in the draft allocation plan, it provides up to six months of assistance and the determination of how much assistance is needed is going to be made by the nonprofit who has the case manager. The case manager will use a housing stability plan and with the family participating in this program will decide and will determine how much assistance is needed and for how long. Um, in addition to how much and how long, they will also discuss additional services that they may need, such as budgeting classes or, um, or um, debt management classes, any other support services that are gonna be needed to assist them in becoming and remaining self-sufficient after the maximum six months is, is met. We are hoping to serve 220 um, households under this activity. The next activity you see, um, as you can tell, it's 15.6% of the funding, and it's our tenant-based rental assistance program. Tenant-based rental assistance, the difference with this program from homelessness prevention is that people don't have a home. Program participants that come in the tenant-based rental assistance program have to meet what HUD calls a category one or a category two homeless. So what in the world does that mean, right? Um, the layman's term of a category one means that they're literally homeless. They are living in a place that is not meant for habitation, such as their car, or they may be living in, in one of our shelters. We've got shelters here in, in Collin County. They may be living in one of those. Um, any of those situations fit under a category one homeless. But I also mentioned this program is for category two homeless. Category two homeless is somebody that is at risk of being homeless. And what HUD says that means they're at, at risk of imminent homelessness. That means in 14 days, they know they're gonna be without a place to stay. That means they've gone through the eviction process. And, and the eviction court, the judge has ruled and they have to leave within 14 days. Um, either they have already left, so it's 14 days past when they left, or it's 14 days till they have to actually leave. Um, and that's what HUD says. Um, they'll qualify as a category two if they've met that 14 day rule, plus they don't have any other place to stay and they are saying that they do not have any other family or financial resources um, to help them or support networks to help them become permanently housed. So when you're thinking about tenant-based rental assistance program, what it does is it takes that category one or two individual, allows them to get an apartment through case management and housing navigation, a lease in their own name. So we're taking them from no home to now they have a home and a lease in their name. And it will provide assistance for up to 24 months of assistance for rent and utilities, as well as case management, more case management and housing navigation more than likely with this program because, than, than the homelessness prevention program because the nature of their housing situation is just different. The next thing that you see here is case management and housing navigation. I've mentioned this for the both programs. That's because both programs are gonna have case management and need someone to assist in housing navigation, at least for tenant-based rental assistance. That's something that's not operated by City of Plano staff. We do not do case management at all. So whatever nonprofits are going to be selected to carry out these activities, they're gonna use those funds in that manner. The next is, um, the next home ARP activity is administration. That part is for our subrecipients. So, so yes, case management and housing navigation is one thing. But when we're talking about the administration that you see here on this chart, that's for indirect cost. Um, they may have a finance person that is doing their money that they have to pay for. They may have a lease that they have to pay for because of where they're operating at. They may have to pay their electri electricity bills. All that is covered under this 50,000 administration. And then the last one is the city of Plano's administration. Out of the $1.9 million, 2.52%, this 50,000 is the only part the city is proposing to set aside to use for, um, for subrecipient training and ongoing monitoring. Um, we plan on um, training a lot, whichever subrecipient or subrecipients that we have. But it's not just the it's not just one training. It is an ongoing discussion and training with them because we want to make sure that they're successful. If they're successful in using this money, then when HUD comes and monitors us, we're going to be successful in not having to return the funds for using it in an improper way. 
So let's talk about next steps. We're having a public hearing tonight. Um, and as I said, this is a draft allocation plan. It's a draft um, until you all approve it. It's a draft. So we'll have the public hearing tonight. Um, if you all choose to approve this, then we plan on submitting it to HUD by January the 18th. And um, we'll go ahead on the staff side to start preparing a request for a proposal. We're not going to let, so when we move into the mid-January to March, HUD has 45 days to approve this. What that means is if they don't send us a letter disapproving it, what the, what the regulations say is a letter, if you don't receive a letter of disapproval, it's approved. So on that 46th day, if they haven't sent us anything asking us to do anything else, we know they've approved it. And it's when we hit that 45-day mark that we now know we can let out the RFP. We'll let out the RFP to a lot of our organizations, any organization that we keep on our nonprofit list, as well as groups that we participate in here at the city of Plano, um, which is like the Collin County Homeless Coalition, um, CCSSA, Collin County Social Services Association. Um, um, we also will send it out to Housing Forward, formerly known as MDH8, because they have a lot of um, other organizations that are in what we call a continuum of care network that help um, residents that may be interested in applying. So we'll let it out um, in, in the time frame here. So by mid-March, we should let that out. And then hopefully have a program up and running by May, um, advertising it to our residents so that we're ready to, um, to help. So, Jeanette, theoretically, then, uh, nonprofits in the community somewhere around the first or second week of March theoretically could have access to funds if everything goes according to that timeline. That's about 45 days from the 18th. We would then let an RFP out to decide which nonprofits. Correct. Yeah, you're right. They would Perfect. be applying. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's my presentation. I'm here to you. answer questions. Any questions for, for staff? Councilman Grady. Um, thank you very much. Um, it, as council probably knows, I'm shoulder deep in all of this most of the time, so I'll try to be very succinct. I have a few questions and then a, a few comments on the program that, that um, I just need some clarification on. You said on the cover page um, that we're really looking at HUD's classification or HUD's definition of homelessness in category one, category two. Um, then on page two of the actual document in the executive summary, um, we actually talk on the bottom of page two, the second item there, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, um, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking, which to me is category four definition within the within the HUD definition. I think that's very important to have this in here, to be candid, but I just wanted to make sure, are we talking only category one, category two, or are we also talking about category four? So being that this is a template, when HUD speaks about their targeted populations, all of their populations that they call target are listed in here, in this executive summary. So that when someone reads the executive summary, they know these funds could be used for any of these target populations. And when we write this report, we have to touch on how we are going to assist every target population. But you are correct, you know, a category four homeless is, is domestic violence. So, so what that means though, the way our programs are here, we could still be assisting. You know, we have a homeless shelter and transitional shelters here in Plano. We could still help somebody that HUD would say is a category four homeless, right? But they're living in a shelter. And if they're living in a shelter, they're not a category four homeless. They meet the category one homeless definition. Just okay, I just HUD wanted to speak. make, I yeah. wanted to make sure because oh, I, I understand how HUD classifies <laughs> I also understand how HUD asks for certain documentation of each one. So documentation of category four is different than documentation of category one. It's also different if you're looking at homelessness uh, on under other federal statutes, which is category three. <laughs> um, so different documentation yeah. uh, is needed. I wanted to make sure that we were robust enough that we weren't excluding anybody that was in need, that we were including as many as we could. A um, couple other questions, and then I'll, I'll make a couple of comments that I think um, are important. Um, 
We talked in here about the need um, from uh, HUD to talk to various uh, various recipients in the area. Um, this is basically in, on the top of page four and, the, and on page five. And part of that, um, in the we're talking with the continuum of care, but we're also talking to homeless and domestic violence service providers, veterans groups, public housing agencies, public agencies, et cetera. Um, I didn't see that we actually had an opportunity to talk to veterans groups because it's not in the list on there, yet we have the Veterans Center of North Texas. So I don't know if we communicated with them and they did not respond, um, or if we just missed that category. So Veterans Center of North Texas is included when we are talking to the Collin County Homeless Coalition board representatives, because the coalition's board represents their members. They've been elected, or, or you know that, um, by those that are in the organization to be on the board. Um, and so that representation is there. Um, additionally, when we spoke to the Housing Authority, we mentioned veterans with them because they have VASH vouchers. So we talked to yes. them about that program as well. Okay, uh, because I know that on the um, Collin County Homeless Coalition, they are a participant in the group. They're not on the board, You're right. but they are a participant in the group. Um, uh, for all uh, disclosure purposes, I am actually on the board. I am actually a veteran. That's why I know. Um, so I just want to make sure that, that we covered that, that area and, and made sure that we included them um, in the process. The, um, the things, council members, the things that I, I saw in here, which I think are, are, are very important. Um, so let me kind of get an idea on it. Again, as I mentioned, there's four different types of categories um, that typically are defined in different types of documentation uh, that, re that HUD requires. Um, I'm certainly glad to see in some of the requirements under the definitions uh, or some of the documentation, the use of the word or rather than the use of the word and. I struggle with the use of the word and in some of their definitions because when you have a domestic violent situation, it is not always that you're going to get documentation. It is more statements than it is documentation. Um, also, when we have an intimate risk of homelessness, the issue that I have in, in basically the, the HUD definitions is they're looking at a very narrow window. And as you mentioned, 14 days, you know that an eviction is coming across because the eviction has already been issued probably by the courts because it takes a very long period of time for the courts to make that decision. They need the proof. Um, and then they're going to issue a writ which allows you to then basically remove the tenant and remove the furnishings from the unit. Um, and 14 days is a pretty narrow thing. So my only comment on that is that at some time, somewhere along the line, some smart legislator is going to determine that that's too narrow and they, and they need to broaden it. But that's not going to happen this session. Um, I did like the, um, the tables that you had in here that described what the real needs are. Because what I'm seeing is that out of, and these are, are the, your numbers that you provided on the top of page eight, there's 30, a little over 39,000 total rental units within the city. Um, but there is still a gap of 3,210. Um, and I think it's important as we start looking at the issue of affordable housing within the city that we don't begin to take a look at the word affordable and, and color that in a different, in a different manner. Um, we need housing in the city and we need housing to take care of all of our different populations. And as we have seen the current um, rental situation within the city, we can see that on page 11, right near the bottom, where we're saying current fair market rents for a two bedroom apartment in Plano is between $2,088 a month and $2,820 a month. If you calculate that out from the standpoint and as you have done, um, you would need to earn somewhere between $84,000 and $113,000 a year to afford a two bedroom apartment in the city of Plano. Um, and thus the significant need um, within the city for 
types of housing that people can live in that do not earn eighty-four to one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars a year. And so, it is an issue that we're facing across the country. It is an it is an issue that we talk about on the National League of Cities boards every single time we have a meeting. Um, but it is something that we really do need to take a look at for our citizens in the city of Plano. This is a huge issue, and it is the reason that we have a significant amount of at-risk population spending 50% or more of their income simply on housing. Um, I also found it interesting that if somebody is in the warming station overnight, we count them as sheltered or, non, or, or not sheltered. They will be unsheltered the following morning. Um, and yet we, we it, the HUD requires us to classify that as a sheltered individual when they really aren't a sheltered individual. So um, again, somewhere along the line, some smart legislator um, will eventually find that out and change that. Um, I was a little bit concerned on the percentages of how we broke out supportive services and tenant-based rental assistance in that do we really have to have that hard of a line that says so much percentage goes to this program and so much percentage goes to that program, can we allow the administrator of that program, whomever that might be with the RFP, to make the determination as to how they classify it when the individual comes in? That's a question. Yes, that's so, a question. <laughs> um, we are not allowed to do that. When we submit this plan to HUD, they want to know what category specifically by the HUD home art categories. Um, for instance, you know, we're calling homelessness prevention support services. We normally, when I speak to you all, I don't refer as homelessness prevention as support services. I refer to it as homelessness prevention. But HUD says it's a support service. So we have to use those categories um, to set up the activity. So once HUD approves this plan, we have to set up the activities in HUD system in this same way. So the fluidity that you're speaking of, it has to work within the budgeted line item. And any contract that we do at the city is going to follow, it has to follow that, that, um, that breakdown. Okay. We are able to, as, a, as the allocate, if this allocation is approved tonight, submitted to HUD and HUD approves it, um, what our citizen participation plan says is that we can <clears throat> adjust line item budgets 25%. Once it goes past 25% of the budgeted line item, we then just do another public hearing. It's a substantial amendment to the allocation plan. We do a public hearing and, um, and then you all hear, you hear from the public and you decide if you wanna make that. But they do want concrete amounts um, submitted. Okay, so I think if, the, if I've got the answer correctly, or at least what you're, what you're saying, is that there is some flexibility. We have to, we have to issue, the, issue under the percentages that you're talking about, what we think it's going to be. But over a period of time, if we run out of tenant-based rental assistance and we have a whole gob sitting over here in supportive services, we can have a public hearing and move funds. And you all have done just that in the past with, with regular CDBG and home funds. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to make it. sure because we don't know if this program starts in May what it's going to look yeah. like in December of next year. Um, the, and that, that brings up my other comment. We've been obviously working on this September of 2021 of looking at these things. So the, the faster we can get this money out into the community, the better off our community is going to be because they, aren't, they haven't stopped hurting they are hurting more and more as inflation has been nipping away at the housing industry and, and as pricing go out. Finally, I found it very interesting um, on page 21, which is a comment under tenant-based rental assistance, um, and this was um, issued by one of the people that was being interviewed, um, was that rapid rehousing is already a lot of work to market to landlord, and it's a huge battle. And I hear that all the time. 
Um, I hear that all the time from the agencies that we currently use today. And, and kind of my message right now going out to everybody that has the 39,000 units that are sitting out there. And I understand what it is to, to manage a rental property. But we need to understand that just because somebody has a voucher in their hand does not mean that this person is a bad person. It means that this person needs some help. And having this battle all the time by individual landowners making a decision they don't want to rent to somebody because we've gone to them with a voucher has got to stop at some point in time. So um, I'm looking at that pretty deeply to see what are the pushbacks from everyone that are saying they don't want to rent to somebody for various reasons. It could be they don't earn enough. That's probably the biggest one that I hear. They look at it and say, they need to be earning enough to cover three months worth of rent. At $2,000 a month for a unit, and they need $6,000 in their pocket, and they're homeless is a way of getting around the fact that you don't want to rent to somebody. And that's the way that I read it. Um, so anyway, uh, council members, we have worked on this for a very long period of time, longer than it should be. Um, I just want to say that I'm in support of getting this money out in the community just as fast as we possibly can, but we need to be able to look at the community as we go forward and make modifications to be able to change it for what we, what's being needed in the community rather than what HUD is saying, you can only have 85% in this bucket and 15% in that. Thank you very much. I'll yield back. Any other questions for staff? Hey, hey, yeah, just a comment. I appreciate the work you put in. I had one clarifying question, uh, and I think Councilman Gray had touched on some of it. As you know, my big concern is helping pay the utility bills for folks because one thing that can make you homeless about as fast as not paying your rent, obviously, is not paying your utility. So you may have a home, but you have no heat or water or anything going on there. The Utility assistant, is that in our supportive services number or is that the T uh, TBRA number there? Because Councilman Grady asked a question that we kind of touched on a little bit is that it, we do have some flexibility to move things around because I know we ran out of utility assistance early last time and I'd like to see that not happen this time because it's going to be even worse. This can go around, I'm afraid. So we have two different home art activities. One is the homelessness prevention, the support mm -hmm. services. That's where we're paying for somebody already housed. So if somebody has utilities, that's me making the assumption they're already housed. And they paid their house, they paid their rent, they can't pay their utilities. This program is home ARP. We are allowed to pay utilities as a offset, uh, as a secondary factor to keeping somebody in their home. But what we're not allowed to do is consistently only pay someone's right. utilities. Because with home ARP, anytime you all hear me speak about the home anything, regular home money, home ARP, home means the focus of the funds have to be at providing a home. And you're correct. I understand exactly what you're saying. Someone could become homeless if they don't have their utilities paid or if they don't get it paid. It could be a factor of it but it has to be secondary for these funds. So we still can do it, but when we get monitored by HUD, what we can't show is that we've helped people, a lot of people only helping them with their utility bills because then HUD is gonna say, how did you help them stay in their home? Right, so, so again, one of the things that I think that uh, you had mentioned, we talked about anyway, was assuming that, that uh, we were at a point that you know, we couldn't just pay like utilities if someone were hypothetically to be struggling to pay rent and utilities they'd probably be better served with our support to pay the utilities and get assistance to pay the rental potential just hypothetically if they choose to do that yeah okay okay great thanks i won't go into any further than that I'll open the public hearing. There are no speakers on this um, item. 
So I'll close the public hearing, confine the comments to the council. I have one other question uh, that I might add. Page seven. We have two summaries at the top of the page, and with their, their space left blank to update upon receiving comments. Have we received any comments yet? We have not received any comments yet. Okay. Um, I did, if it helps, we met with um, a representative from an organization today who asked questions mm -hmm. about the plan, but as far as giving comments, other than, okay, this is good, that's something that we, we wouldn't write. It's not written, so. Yeah. Do we know any reason why we haven't received any comments? Is it probably not general knowledge? I know that we published it in the newspaper, uh, Plan of Star Courier. Um, I know that we published it on our website, and I know that we issued some emails out to various organizations, but, um, you know, nothing? This public participation is a hard thing for yeah. any city government. Okay. Um, it, it's just hard. Um, if you talk to our colleagues, our other um, community development housing professionals that are in other cities, they too struggle with the same issue mm -hmm. of getting people to just respond, be it going out to get people's input, sending it out. We were hoping that when we sent the email out to the Con County Homeless Coalition, just tell them, hey, this is coming, this, that we would get, maybe they could send it to their people. But um, a lot of times when we do get comments, if we get them, they're from organization directors. So we didn't receive any comments um, in writing, um, had the verbal comments, they had two verbal comments actually today, um, one on the phone and then um, the one from, from the meeting we had where they said they're in agreement, but that's it. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Motion to second to approve agenda item number two. Please vote. Excuse me. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item. Item number three, public hearing and consideration of a resolution to authorize the establishment of the downtown public improvement district within the city of Plano, Texas, in accordance with chapter 372 of the Texas Local Government Code and authorizing and directing the filing of this resolution and providing for related matters and providing an effective date. Good evening, Council. Peter Brasser, Director of Special Projects, here to talk about reestablishing a public improvement district in downtown Plano. Uh, the, the property owners in the district went out and petitioned and came up and met the thresholds with this map here. Um, and uh, as you all know about downtown Pitt already, so this is a PID. We did change the way the levees were done, but the proposed levy is now based on square footage of building instead of value of property. So that will stabilize the income stream as we go forward. And unless you uh, increase the square footage of your building or your improvement, um, your levy would stay the same for the next 10 years. Um, so uh, again, uh, the petition was approved by 80% of the appraised value, that is the number one threshold, and then you need to meet the next one of the other two of above 50%, and we met all three thresholds within the state law. The proposed levy, again, is 15 cents per uh, square foot of improvements, um, and all the property owners are on the advisory board, um, and the quorum is any five members. Um, so. What this does is it makes it actually much more inclusive than before there was a committee, and this is now anybody who comes to the meetings, which will be regularly scheduled, and the term is five years. Uh, the use of the fund is, again, uh, similar to the last PID, which is a promote, mainly going to the promotion of the district. It can enhance security if that's what they, the uh, committee decides, and then constructing and maintaining placemaking uh, uh, elements in the city. This is all done, all of these decisions are done by the property owners and not by city staff. So this is um, for and by the district members. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I think we may have speakers as well. Yeah. Any questions for staff? Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I saw uh, that the thresholds were met for the, the petitions uh, in terms of uh, uh, number of petitioners and ownership within the uh, public improvement district. Um, 
for the uh, for the ones who didn't uh, participate in the petitioning, you know, who are not among the sixty one point one percent of the area or seventy percent of owners, were any uh, actually opposed, or they just didn't provide feedback? We, as a city, we received one letter in opposition, and they are not included in the PID. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you. Open the public hearing. Thank you, Peter. We'll open the public hearing. We have five speakers on this item, and the first one is Myrna Lynch. Good evening and Happy New Year to the Mayor and the Council. I'm here because I have owned property in downtown Plano on 15th Street since the early 80s, and there have been many goals and publications set through the years as to where we want to go, how we want to get there, but somehow we have not gotten there. The PID has been a great vehicle because it involves the owners and a partnership with the city. And we're seeing more movement. Hopefully before I pass away, <laughs> we complete a whole bunch of it. But I fully support this vehicle for moving this district to where it needs to be. We are a diamond in the rough. We're trying to get to that big status of Tiffany look, and we're hopeful that this next one is going to get us there. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is William Cravens. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is William Cravens. I'm president of Metropolitan Interest Corporation. We have three properties that are located in the PID. One of them is the uh, building that's occupied by the Fillmore Pub. The other one is the old uh, one of the Star Courier building at 1015 15th Street, and the other is the at 15th Apartments. Uh, we elected to get into the PID because we thought it was a very beneficial thing uh, for both the city and downtown. The PID increases our uh, public interest in downtown Plano and is the glue that binds together owners and merchants. It provides a mechanism for the management of downtown and a vehicle for planning and conducting most events that are marketed in downtown. The PID funding comes directly from property owners, as you can see, along with the partnership with the city. And this in itself provides an opportunity for the property owners to have an opportunity to sit at the table of the PID uh, uh, advisory council and therefore we have a, a say in it. It's a very positive thing from the city. I think it's something that would be helpful and uh, continues to be helpful and we look forward to your approving it again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is James Russell. James Russell. Then we will move on to Bill Lyle. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Bill Lyle, 1724 15th Place. I also own three pop properties within this PID, uh, 1307, 1311, and 11, uh, Avenue K, and 1106 14th Street. I'm also here to cast my uh, support to recreating this PID. I would just have a quick question for Peter. You said five years. It says 10 years, is it? It is 10 years. Okay, it's 10 years. Uh, anyway, I am wanted to make that clarification, but 
I am asking you to approve the PID tonight on behalf of the downtown area. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker is Bonnie Shea. Good evening, Mayor Munns and councilmen and women. Thank you very much for having us here tonight. I am Bonnie Shea. I am the chairman of the PID Com Management Committee and have been since we started it seven years ago. I'm also a business owner and building owner of multiple buildings and businesses in downtown Plano, most of which start with urban, but some don't. Um, but we have a total between all of our businesses downtown, almost 300 employees. Um, what we really wanted to talk about tonight is that we want to thank you and thank Frank Turner and thank the previous city council for implementing the first PID seven years ago. It has been a great asset for the city and for the downtown merchants and building owners. As we talked about seven years ago, the historic Downtown Plano Association, or now the Downtown Plano Arts and Heritage Foundation, could not exist without the underlying financial support of the city and the pit. During the last seven years, we have transitioned the original HDPA merchant organization into a 501c3 foundation organization. With the support of the PID, the organization has been able to work independently and execute its mission of preserving downtown Plano's historic character and embracing its future through the efforts of an executive director and the board of our foundation. While the board of the foundation, which many of the board are here today and I'd like them to stand or show, and Bob with the Masonic Lodge is here, as well as other building owners as, we, as we've discussed um, downtown. The board of the foundation consists of many busy building owners and the operating merchants that are willing to serve. The ED is an independent contractor serving for the foundation to not only organize the board and the communications of the membership of the HTPA, but also to serve a very important role of being not only the event planner, planner and coordinator for the downtown events and activities, but also to be the liaison between the merchants, the building owners, and the city manager's office. This role has been made seconds. possible through the funds of the PID. We believe as building owners and merchants, having an independent director represents the organization with the city as a critical factor in the success of the PID and the foundation. The PID in its original form seven years ago renewed again five years ago, only had a five-year term. And this created multiple issues with having an executive director of the, of the board. And because of that, we didn't have a stable organization. We only had five years. The end of four and a half years, we had to hope that we renewed the PID so that the executive director would have a job. And so by providing a new renewal of this PID with a 10-year term, this will provide stability for our organization in order to manage it um, over the next 10 years. With this renewal of the PID, we... Bonnie, your time's up, but... but do I I'm, have to stop? I'm, I, I care so much about you. I'm going to give you okay. just another minute. Just know that we really are appreciative of the renewal of the PID. The PID is reducing in size because of the footprint that is now voting for the PID. And because of that, financially, it will have less money than it's had for the last seven years, which for downtown Plano should not really have happened. And we want to make sure that we can change that. We can get back in to having this PID, get it started back again, and then within a couple of years, repetition the footprint again to get more building owners into the PID. Thank you very much. Thank you.
So I'm just, uh, you can close the public hearing, but the resolution attached, I want to make it clear that that is just uh, approving the PID, not the levy. We'll be coming back for that. Got it. Thank you, Peter. I'll close the public hearing, confine the comments to the council. Motion, motion. to approve the, uh, the PID. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to approve item number three. Yeah. Item number three, please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. <laughs> Next item. Item number four, public hearing and consideration of a resolution to authorize the establishment of the Haggard Farm Public Improvement District within the city of Plano, Texas, in accordance <coughs> with chapter 372 of the Texas Local Government Code and authorizing and directing the filing of this resolution, providing for related matters and providing an effective date. Good evening, Peter Brasser again, uh, Director of Special Projects. Uh, Haggard Farm is a uh, a development, um, I think you've heard the uh, planning and zoning case with it uh, some time ago. This is an area, uh, the landowner of the two parcels that are now currently made up of this uh, public imp proposed public improvement district have signed, um, so 100% response. Um, this is a, a property, as you can see here on the map, uh, surrounded by Parkwood and Spring Creek with a future of Pinecrest along the southern border. Um, it is a master planned uh, development of mix of uses. Um, as you can see from here, there's um, office, uh, multifamily, single family uh, townhouse, um, and a hotel and retail, all in this 120 some odd acres. Um, the first phase is um, in pre development now, and it, they have come up against some uh, need for a public um, financing. So they have established, they have petitioned to establish this PID. Um, and so, uh, and here is sort of that first phase in um, uh, rendering view with the hotel and the retail in the foreground. Sorry. So the uh, Haggard Park Farm, sorry, Haggard Farm, I keep saying park and I don't mean that. Haggard Farm uh, Public Improvement District is, um, you're approving it now. What this does for the development and the property owner is allow them to possibly reimburse should public financing be approved later on. We will come back to you with not only that, but a development agreement between us and the property owners and developers. Um, they want to use the potential of a levy to fund uh, public infrastructure which, um, and that method has yet to be determined. We'll be working that out with them, either a bond similar to what we did with Collin Creek or a debt repayment, which is a, a loan based on getting paid back by levies in the future. Um, we intend through the development agreement process to iron out the di differences and, and have how the levy would be done and who gets the levy. And it's all done on um, the benefit of the proportional benefit of the improvements that are proposed. So we want to work that out. The reason we're here tonight with this now um, is because, again, it's about allowing the development to move forward. I, the applicant, the applicant, sorry, the petitioner is here. They do have a office tenant that is on the schedule. And so this would allow them to sort of get started with engineering and with the hope of getting reimbursed for that. I'm, I think that's about it for the basis of this action and this public hearing. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions uh, for Peter? <clears throat> Councilman Riccadelli. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and thank you, Peter. Uh, I just wanted to uh, confirm, and, and we've discussed this before, but uh, there will be no assessment on city property within the PID. That, that's correct? That is correct. And also the idea is for this to be no risk to the city, you know, in, in the sense that you know, if, if uh, the assessments don't materialize, the, the city's not backing the bonds other than with the assessment uh, from the PID. That is correct. Our duty under the, if we were to do bonds, would be to do, uh, take foreclosure properties on those, uh, foreclosure actions on those, sorry, the tax lien mm -hmm. process. We mm -hmm. would take that action. That would be the only thing left. Um, if it were to be foreclosed upon for non-payment and the bank takes it back, it'd be silly for them not to pay because we would mm. get it for cheap. So, um, yeah, mm. but that is the only risk is that whole uh, uh, foreclosure portion of it. 
So, so just to understand that it, the risk essentially is that we might have to, as a city, take foreclosure actions if there Correct. is non-payment. Just like a tax sale, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And then I have uh, uh, feedback on the PID, but uh, I know we're doing questions right now, so I can I can bifurcate that and wait. Uh, if Hold on certainly, we will do. All right. Thanks, Peter. I'll open the public hearing. We have a speaker. We do, Aaron Haas. Will any, any questions for the applicant? All right. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing, confine the comments to the council. You're, you're good to go now. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I definitely want to do things uh, procedurally correct. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, Peter's answers to those questions, uh, you know, take care of, of all of my concerns about uh, this PID except for one, and that's that in the ordinance that we're looking at tonight, there's no disclosure requirement, and as Peter pointed out, if the PID assessments aren't paid, the, the city is going to be the one foreclosing. You know, ultimately, we have to collect these assessments. If folks say, hey, I didn't know that I was signing up for paying these assessments, it's the city they're paying them to. And, um, you know, so I, I think the city has a real interest in making sure that disclosures are made in the way that they should be. Um, and to toward that end, um, and I'll, I'll pass this around, I have some, some proposed language. I'm not wedded to this language, but essentially this would be the concept of what I think we need to add into the ordinance to, to make sure something along these lines uh, to make if, sure. If I may, oh, um, certainly. there is a state law that takes that into account. Oh, okay. um, this will be recorded with the county, this, this resolution, and so it will be attached to and discoverable by the title companies, as well as um, the state now, it happened, I think, in the last legislature, a state requirement that disclosure forms be signed upon purchase and sale of agreements. So a lot of that is already done and covered by state law. Oh, thank you. And, and Director Fortune was just putting that up there. If we could project that oh, so that oh, anyone sorry. who's following along uh, in the in the gallery might be able to see it. My, my concern is is I understand there, there are going to be disclosures. Did, did he not answer? the issue that you have? So I, I, I still uh, respectfully have a concern and I appreciate the information uh, for, from Peter, but um, my concern is not that there aren't going to be any disclosures, but uh, a resident wrote in regarding uh, some issues that have arisen at uh, uh, a senior development called Edgemere in Dallas where, um, where apparently, you know, the disclosures were made, but as, as everyone knows, when you buy property, you know, there's a mountain of paperwork and it matters um, how the disclosure is made, you know, it can be in that, in that paperwork, but, you know, people may still not subjectively know just because a lot of times people don't read, you know, everything that they're, that they're signing. So what I was going to, uh, to ask that our ordinance require just to protect the city from the exposure of, of, you know, being the bad guy and, and having to foreclose on something that somebody may say, Hey, I didn't read the paperwork and I don't even know about this. Um, you know, is to have this one pager um, that would uh, disclose to all buyers of property within the PID that they'll be obligated to pay these PID assessments. And, and I would ask that we mandate that it be a single page document written in easy to understand terms that includes the following or something, you know, similar to it in bold capital letters, important notice about ongoing obligation to pay annual assessments. The buyer needs to understand that the property buyer is buying is part of a public improvement district or PID that was created at the developer's request. As a result, the buyer will have to pay additional PID assessments to the city of Plano every year in addition to and on top of the property taxes that the buyer would normally pay to the city of Plano. Typically, developers pay the cost of certain infrastructure that has to be built as part of their project. Such developers then recover those expenditures through the purchase price such that it is essentially included in the purchase price. That is not the case here. You will be paying the PID assessments annually on top of the purchase price for this property. And then I would ask that also our ordinance require that, um, that, that, uh, um, that, that uh, there be some language in the ordinance that would mandate requirement either through a covenant running with the land or some other mechanism that would require disclosure to subsequent buyers, not just the first buyer, but when they sell to the second buyer, the third buyer, uh, disclosure to subsequent buyers of the existence of these PID assessments. And I would also ask that the ordinance require that that single page disclosure be signed on that same single page by all owners 
uh, of the property, who are, who are buying that property. And I think in, in this way, you know, we'll go above and beyond the, the, the existing requirements of, of state law. And I think it protects the city because otherwise, you know, we could end up being the bad guy, you know, foreclosing. There's a senior housing development here. We could end up, you know, foreclosing on uh, seniors. And, and, and you know, I, I mean, I, I just really think this will provide additional protection for the city from an even more robust disclosure point of view. So I would ask that we include this in the ordinance and, and uh, you know, just table to the next meeting so that the staff can write this up uh, into the ordinance. This is, um, if I may, I've seen the, the state requirement. It's very, very similar to this. Um, a couple of things on this is that they don't pay us. They pay the, the Collin County Appraisal District. Oh. Other thing. Um, and so all, we don't actually get the money. It goes into the, the fund for the PID. And so I don't know that we handle the money at all. OK, gotcha. So yeah, so the language, uh, and again, yeah, I'm not so, wedded to this language. Again, Clearly, that was an error yeah, on my part. The state requirement but, yeah. is exactly how you want it. It is a single page document that talks about just the same things you just did. OK. And they have to sign it as part of the whole process of purchasing. Okay, well, and, and so may, maybe that is the case, and somehow somehow people still just didn't read what they signed. If I, and, if I, if you know, I know the case it, you're yeah. talking about, it, yeah. it predates um, the new state law requirements. Oh, it predates the new state law. Okay, so that, yeah. that's how that occurred. I was thinking perhaps it's, you know, you, you know, a lot of a lot of things that are required by state law, you can bury them in 83 pages of Right. So of now, in the, so, like in the yeah. downtown one, we didn't have that disclosure. We now will be putting that in there. And so, um, and noticing the property owners within the bid that they have to disclose it because it is a new thing. Um, okay. So, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Well, well, very good. Very Well, thank you so, for that information, Peter. Uh, so, Councilman, yeah. does... Yes. It sounds as if, and I'm making sure because there's a, a yeah. discussion going back and forth, it sounds as if the, the state law covers the elements that you were asking for as far as disclosure and handles the elements that you were outlining, I think, of, of general management and conveyance on that um, within those documents. Is that correct? You know, it sounds like it, it very well may. I, I would still, you know, ask to table this. I'd love to, to see that state law before voting on this. And, you know, if, if it really is going to cover this issue, you know, that, that was just uh, something I was uh, not not previously aware of and, and, and that I guess we hadn't uh, discussed. So I was under the impression that there were no, uh, you know, no, no requirements to do this type of a disclosure. If, if that's really what the state law requires, I would have no further issues with it. So would a five minute recess for you to be able to research that uh, with Peter provide you enough time to? to Certain, certainly, yeah. I mean, if okay. the staff is able to pull it up right away, I hate to, to cause a recess, but I. Sorry, yeah. just, just confirmation. Yeah. So Peter, what you're saying is that at this time, disclosure is required, is mandatory under state law. Yes. And, and that is, um, it is specifically built in, in in any type of agreement that um, it is signed. Am, am yes, it's a, when you, the stack of documents, there will be a single page that says you're in a PID and there's a levy. And that is uh, separately needs to be acknowledged and signed. Yes. Just like in real estate transactions where um, we're required to say a uh, initial and sign separate documents yes. with regard to like special notice, notice, warning, you know. Lead paint, all that stuff, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, appreciate it. Can you it fairly quickly? I, I believe I can, yes. Okay, well then we'll take a five minute break. Thank y'all.
reconvene. Well, th thank you for that uh, recess. You know, I've taken a, had an opportunity to take a look at the trek form that uh, Mr. Braster and the, and the city manager pulled up. And, uh, um, you know, while I would love it if the, the language is pretty strong, I would love it if the language is even stronger, but I'm not going to endeavor to rewrite trek forms. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to rewrite the trek forms that are that are used throughout the state. So I'm, I'm good with it and uh, ready to move forward. So, yeah. Sure, I, I will. I will move to approve this. Second. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Item five. Item five, consideration of a resolution to approve and authorize the city manager to execute an escrow agreement relating to the Haggard Farm Public Improvement District and resolving other matters related thereto. This item is a, sorry, this item is a companion to the previous item and it is, we are proposing this um, because we do not have a development agreement in place just yet. And so this would, if that doesn't happen or they, the financing doesn't happen, if all bunch of things <laughs> that we don't know yet, today happens, this will ex make the uh, PID expire within two years. Um, the developer hasn't signed this yet, but they have agreed to sign it. And so, um, that's why we're here before you. It's a, another, a yet another safeguard for the city uh, moving forward. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Appreciate it. Any questions for Peter? Thank you, Peter. I'll open the public hearing. This is not a public hearing. Oh, it wasn't? No. Nope. <laughs> you have to revert. Two is enough. I'll close it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, do I have a motion to approve the resolution? Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion a second to approve agenda item number five. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Item six. Item six. Consideration to approve a public infrastructure easement acquisition agreement buying between the City of Plano, Texas and Plano Mall owner LP, a Delaware limited partnership, and authorizing the city manager to execute all necessary documents. Good evening, Peter Browser, Director of Special Projects. This is my last item for the night. <laughs> um, this is uh, an agreement to purchase right-of-way within the Assembly Park development. Um, this uh, right-of-way purchase would be um, funded by uh, 2013 bond money. Um, this is to support the redevelopment of retail, which this project does then qualify. Um, it is a straight purchase of easements with improvements. Um, in your package, you see mapping of the different items that we are acquiring, water lines, sewer, that kind of thing. Um, the actual improvement cost, the site work, is about 1.3 million. I can't read that much, but, and then the property easement themselves is uh, the remaining amount to get up to 2.3 million. I don't believe I have anything else, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And the developer's also here. All right, thank you. Any questions for Peter? Thank you, Peter. I now open the public hearing. This is not a public hearing. Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry. It, yes, it is. Is it? <laughs> public infrastructure, not public hearing. Once again, I got bad information. <laughs> it's right <late>. here. <laughs> right here. It's my mistake. <laughs> Close it, but let's go ahead and close it. <laughs> How about motion to, to motion to approve? Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. I have a motion to second to approve agenda item number six. Any questions? Comments? Please vote. Motion passes seven to zero. Mr. Rick, uh, Riccadelli did not vote. <laughs> Abstain, excuse me. There being no further business, we're adjourned.
destruction